Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you're watching here is a new simulation that was recently released by NASA that shows us what happens when various stars, including stars similar to our own sun, approach a massive black hole. The event that we usually refer to as the Tidal Disruption Event, TDE. And because this is such a fascinating event, with so many of them being discovered in the last few decades, I wanted to discuss exactly what was discovered in this particular new study, and also discuss some of the most well-known facts about these events, including some of these surprising findings. But let's actually start with a bit of a history. And specifically history in regards to black holes, and one of the scientists, astrophysicists, who is a little bit underappreciated in his original proposals and his original theories. As a matter of fact, this particular person is not really well known almost at all. Unlike Stephen Hawking, unlike Albert Einstein, despite some incredible propositions from this particular scientist, his name is not really commonplace even in his home country. And here I'm talking about Jean-Pierre Luminet, the French astrophysicist who even none of my French friends are aware of, but is an extremely important person in astrophysics and has actually made some incredible discoveries back in the 70s. As a matter of fact, Jean-Pierre Luminet was the first person to actually create an image of a potential black hole. By using rudimentary computer simulations, he was able to create this right here back in 1978. And considering that this was created more than 40 years ago, before advanced computer simulations, and also since this is relatively accurate in the way it presents black holes, this by itself is a pretty big achievement. But he also made a lot of other propositions in regards to other events around black holes. And when working in Paris Observatory back in the 80s, Jean-Pierre Luminet and Brandon Carter invented the concept known as TDE, Tidal Disruption Events, their first work was originally published back in 1982 in Nature magazine. And so in essence, he was responsible for sort of helping us understand how these particular events work and what happens to various stars when they approach a black hole and when they shred it and spaghettify it into essentially what you see right here. And he actually referred to this model as the Stellar Pancake Outbreak Model or pancake flambe in French. And in essence, because of the way that the star is shred, it sort of resembles a pancake once the star material starts to circulate around the black hole. With that one moment when a lot of energy is released from this activity being referred to as a pancake detonation or pancake explosion. But just like a lot of theories, it took quite a while to prove this. And it basically took over a decade, and so until 90s, to finally show that this is exactly what happens and to discover one of these events for real. The first one was discovered using the German slash NASA satellite known as Rosat that was able to discover the first X-ray emissions that seemed to match such an unusual event. And today all of them can be actually discovered in the catalog known as the OpenTD catalog, the link for which you can find in the description. As of December of 2021, there are currently 98 different entries, with the most recent one being this event right here that was discovered somewhere in this galaxy back in June of 2021. And TDs have also explained some of the unusual observations from various supernova, such as the famous supernova discovered in 2015, known as Assassin 12 LH, that was created when a star approached the black hole relatively close, and prior to it being destroyed and essentially absorbed, it sort of detonated, creating a super luminous supernova. But because, generally speaking, when these tidal disruption events occur, a lot of the mass ends up in the accretion disk and starts to produce a lot of energy as most of this starts to circulate and emit different types of radiation, a lot of studies suggested that many of these emissions will be in different types of frequencies including ultraviolet and the X-ray radiation, which will then be absorbed by the surrounding disk that's already around the black hole. And because of this, as a lot of this radiation hits the disk, it's going to be producing different types of radiation, mostly infrared radiation. And so by sort of measuring the differences in different frequencies detected from a certain event, it becomes possible to literally map the black hole itself. Which kind of works like a radar. By basically measuring the reflections from the black hole's disk, and by looking at different frequencies and also the delay between different frequencies, it becomes possible to create a three-dimensional image of the region around the black hole, and it's actually been done several times now. 
and some of the best examples of this usually come from supermassive black holes that have large enough disk where a lot of the emissions will then be easily visible. But I guess one of the other questions is, well, what exactly happens to the star itself? Well, here's one example. Normally, a star basically gets spaghettified. Because of the tidal disruption here, the entire star sort of turns into a really, really long spaghetti of various gases, with most of the gases then creating either the accretion disk or the astrophysical jets, and just a tiny, tiny part of the entire material then falling into the black hole itself. But in the recent simulation that you can also find in the description below, the scientists were more curious to discover if this happens to all of the stars. As a matter of fact, what if a star was more similar to our sun, or even smaller in size? What exactly would happen to those stars? Well, so they did this by simulating a supermassive black hole, and by then also simulating various densities of stars approaching at a certain distance. And in a nutshell, here's what all of this looks like. Notice how some of these objects do become spaghettis, but some of them, at least one of them, doesn't. It actually remains as a star with just a little bit of material lost. And that of course implies that some of the stars will survive this process and will potentially even remain as typical stars. Which is actually a really important discovery because a few years ago the scientists studying our own supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, the one in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, discovered these peculiar objects we currently refer to as G-objects. The video about this is somewhere right there. These G-objects seem to be basically stars that don't really get spaghettified, or at least that's what the scientists think they are. And there are quite a few of them in the region around our own supermassive black hole, which also suggests that they probably exist around other black holes as well. And so this new simulation sort of helps us understand how all of this probably works. And so for this particular study, what the scientists did using a supercomputer is first of all create six virtual black holes with masses between about 100,000 and 50 million masses of the Sun, which would qualify as both intermediate and supermassive black holes. Just as a comparison, the one in the middle of our own galaxy is about 4.1 to 4.3 million masses of the Sun. Different values have been proposed based on different studies. Now then they took a few stars with different sizes, with some of these stars being very massive, about 10 masses of the Sun, but some of them being very small, about 15% the mass of our Sun. And then they basically chugged all of these stars into those black holes, seeing if any of them survive. And here's roughly what happened to all of them. Notice how the ones that are really massive pretty much fall apart, becoming spaghettis. But the smaller ones, specifically the one that's only about 15% the mass of the Sun, survives. While at the same time the one that's basically very similar to our Sun, one solar mass, also survives. These seem to be the only survivors in this particular simulation. And this helped the scientists work out exactly what you need for the star to survive and not to get spaghettified. Density. Density is the most important factor. Only the stars that were denser ended up not getting spaghettified, with some of them maintaining most of their mass. Whereas the stars that were massive all got shred apart and became spaghetti. Although all stars, no matter how dense they were, lost some of their mass. Some of them were only partially tidally disrupted, but some of them were entirely disrupted, disappearing completely. But more importantly, they were also able to figure out the proportion of the star's mass that's going to be lost depending on the original mass of the star, the density of the star, and the mass of the black hole. In other words, they worked out the expressions needed and the math needed to figure out if the star is going to survive or not. And actually, some of these stars, the ones that do survive, remain as stars. They actually still have nuclear reaction on the inside, and some of them, because they lost some of their mass, can actually, in theory, live even longer. Instead of billions of years, some of them might survive for trillions of years because they become red dwarfs. But I guess interestingly, because one of these stars was extremely similar to our Sun, and it was also the star that survived these passages, that's what kind of makes this a little bit more intriguing. It means that if, in theory, something similar to our Sun, or even our Sun, passed very close to the supermassive black hole, there's a very high chance that it's actually not going to get spaghettified, and it's very likely going to survive. But planets are going to disappear. Nothing will survive in orbit of these stars. Pretty much all of the tidal disruption events are going to strip the star system of any object in its orbit. 
so Earth would definitely not be there anymore. Nevertheless, a really interesting study, and a study that potentially helps us solve the mystery of these G objects discovered a couple of years ago. So it looks like G objects are basically just very dense stars, potentially with a lot less mass than some of the other stars in the vicinity. Although I guess for now, that's kind of all we know. Once we learn something else about these unusual events, or once the scientists discover some other mystery, I'll make sure to follow us up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining its channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.